Now let's look in more detail at some of the particular language of the poem. Back to uh, the beginning of Act 2, Scene 1. I'd like to go to the beginning of the scene, where Philip introduces Arthur to their newest ally, the Archduke of Austria. Now, the ironic backstory to this introduction is that the Archduke of Austria is the killer of Richard Cordelion, Richard Lionheart, the older uncle of Arthur, his, brother's, uh, his father's older brother, the former king, Richard. That's not the case historically. It was the Count of Limoges who killed Richard, but Shakespeare has combined the two characters, combined the two historical figures into one character for the purpose of purposes of his narrative. So the scene begins with a very strange alliance, an alliance between a child and the man who killed that child's uncle. Let's look at King Philip's words. Arthur, that great forerunner of thy blood, Richard, that robbed the lion of his heart and fought the holy wars in Palestine, by this brave duke came early to his grave. And for amends to his posterity, at our importance hither is he come, to spread his colors, boy, in thy behalf, and to rebuke the usurpation of thy unnatural uncle, English John. Embrace him, love him, give him welcome hither. Notice that Philip contrasts, on the one hand, the great forerunner Richard with the unnatural English John. So we have one uncle to whom Arthur is connected by his blood, and the other uncle who proves unnatural, who is usurping him. So this division in the family that Philip uh, accentuates, or that Philip expresses. At the, and Philip describes the Archduke of Austria's intentions as to uh, make amends, to mend, to fix. So there's the irony that the person who cut Arthur off literally from his uncle is now amending that link to the forerunner by making Arthur king, by upholding his right to the kingship from Richard to Geoffrey, then to Arthur. Austria, who had cut that, that link, cut that line, is now repairing it, amending it. So in a sense, also, Richard becomes a kind of surrogate father to Arthur because he is the one whose blood is giving Arthur its legitimacy, his legitimacy as the rightful king in their eyes. So he becomes a sort of surrogate father, a replacement father, with Austria as the link between them. Arthur's words express this when he says, God shall forgive you Cor de Leon's death, the rather that you give his offspring life, shadowing their right under your wings of war. Arthur here speaks of, on behalf both of all the offspring of Richard, all the family that Austria gives a life to in his support, but also about himself as the offspring of Richard, of Richard's blood, descended from him. And by giving Arthur life, Austria himself becomes a kind of surrogate father. He continues to Austria, I give you welcome with a powerless hand, but with a heart full of unstained love. Welcome before the gates of Angiers, Duke. Notice how Arthur expresses his political weakness in the image of the powerless hand. That's one of many references to hands and other body parts that are throughout this play that connect the political to the bodily, to the personal, connect the individual to the larger structures of political authority and power. Keep track of those images and, and look at how bodily imagery is deployed in the play. This is pledged to Arthur. Upon thy cheek lay I this zealous kiss, as seal to this indenture of my love, that to my home I will no more return, till Angiers and the right thou hast in France, together with that pale, that white-faced shore, whose foot spurns back the ocean's roaring tides, and coops from other lands her islanders, even till that England, hedged in with the main, that water-walled bulwark, still secure and confident from foreign purposes, even till that utmost corner of the west, salute thee for her king. Till then, fair boy, will I not think of home, but follow arms. To return to the question that I began with, what makes a nation, here Austria gives us one definition, one idea, one image of a nation by describing it through its landscape. As this, he describes that land in bodily metaphors. 
the white-faced shore, the foot that spurns back ocean's roaring tides. So he gives England a, a body. He, he identifies the physical land with the body of England and gives it, uh, these, these images are of its strength and its power and its independence. Father's mother Constance replies, Oh, take his mother's thanks, a widow's thanks, till your strong hand shall help to give him strength to make a more requital to your love. So the strong hand of Austria contrasts with the powerless hand of Arthur. But we have an interweaving of strong and weak, the strong hand and the weak hand, and the strong hand giving its strength to the weak. This interweaving of strength and love as, constant, as Constance sees it. That's how Constance imagines this interweaving, this hybrid, this alliance working. Austria replies with a confident and hawkish remark, the peace of heaven is theirs that lift their swords in such a just and charitable war. So just war is the key to peace, is the path to peace, he argues. Well then, to work. Our cannon shall be bent against the brows of this resisting town. Note the personification of the town. Call for our chiefest men of discipline to cull the plots of best advantages. We'll lay before this town our royal bones, weigh to the marketplace in Frenchman's blood, but we will make it subject to this boy. Constance, however, provides a check on King Philip's uh, warlike rhetoric. She advises, stay for an answer to your embassy, lest unadvised you stain your swords with blood. My Lord Chatillon may from England bring that right in peace, which, he, which here we urge in war, and then we shall repent each drop of blood that hot, rash haste so indirectly shed. Constance serves perhaps as the voice of reason, voice of peace, and she echoes Eleanor's similar remarks to John in Act I when she had said we could have avoided all this with some more kind arguments of love. So on the one hand, we see the women often advising a more cautious, peaceful course of action, advising negotiation. Time, the women will both blame each other for stirring up the conflict. And in fact, some of the historical sources that Shakespeare may have relied on implied that the women were at the root of this conflict. It was a rivalry over authority between Eleanor and Constance. As Constance spoken, then Chatillon arrives, and King Philip remarks about this. A wonder, lady, lo, upon thy wish, our messenger Chatillon is arrived. Now, this is, of course, uh, just a, perhaps a throwaway line, but I think it's significant given that this is a play where strange events happen, unexpected things happen, there are sudden reversals. And what do we see King Philip here doing? He's trying to interpret a coincidence as having some meaning, saying, well, there's a cause and effect. You wished it and he arrived. Again, does, is this, does he mean this literally, that, she, that he literally thinks her wish did it? Probably not. We might interpret it that way, but it's not, necess not necessary to interpret that, that he literally believes it. It's an example in miniature of the ways in which we try to put meaning upon events, the way we try to structure time and history to have some sort of meaning, to give it a cause and effect, to give it a rationale. And that rationale is just what this play consistently denies us. Tatian brings news of England's arrival. England, impatient of your just demands, hath put himself in arms. The adverse winds, whose leisure I have stayed, have given him time to land his legions all as soon as I. His marches are expedient to this town, his forces strong, his soldiers confident. Chatillon explains his delay in England's speed by blaming it on adverse winds, blaming it on the weather. No doubt this would have reminded Shakespeare's audience of the recent affair of the Spanish Armada, when an attempted invasion fleet from Spain was uh, destroyed largely by storms, by adverse storms, interpreted by many as a sign of God's blessing upon Protestant England. So there's perhaps a suggestion, is this England, is this God blessing England by giving John the speed to arrive so quickly on France's shores? And notice the the repeated words that, that stress how fast this is. He's impatient. He's as soon as I. He's, his marches are expedient. So all these words stressing John's sudden and unexpected speed. Chatillon then describes Eleanor 
He says, with him along is come the mother queen, an Ate stirring him to blood and strife. Recall what I just said, how, in fact, Eleanor had been advising him to be more peaceful, that he could have negotiated and gotten out of this conflict, but now she's being blamed as the cause of John's violence and his military uh, approach. Chatillon describes the soldiers as all the unsettled humors of the land, rash, inconsiderate, fiery voluntaries with ladies' faces and fierce dragon spleens. So these soldiers, first humors were the, the thought to be the fluids that made up one's body. There were four different fluids that gave life and determined one's health and physiology and temperament. And so again, we see the land being personified, the people as the blood and the phlegm and all the other fluids, the bile that make up the body of England. The body of England that is a hybrid, that is always in flux, that is a, that is a transforming fluid body of intermixing forces. The soldiers themselves are a sort of hybrid. They, are, they have ladies' faces, that is, they're young, but they have fiery dragon spleens. Inside, they have this fire and power and strength. Soldiers, Chatillon says, have sold their fortunes at their native homes, bearing their birthrights proudly on their backs to make a hazard of new fortunes here. They're gambling. They're putting their fortunes at risk, their fortunes on the line. They're seeking their fortune, their destiny. They're putting themselves at the mercy of the passage of history and hoping that events have a meaning, have a plan, have a path for them. Philip, of course, is surprised by their arrival. How much unlooked for is this expedition? So Philip has been surprised by the turn of events, just as we have repeatedly been and will be repeatedly surprised by the turn of events in the story, just as the other characters will be surprised by the turn of events in the story. Something has happened. It, he doesn't understand it. It doesn't make sense to him. It's, un, it's unlooked for. It's unwanted. But it's happened. John arrives and grandly proclaims himself, Peace be to France, if France and peace permit our just and lineal entrance to our own. John emphasizes the justness of his claim and its reliance on his inheritance, his heritage, his lineage. If not, bleed France and peace ascend to heaven, whilst we, God's wrathful agent, do correct their proud contempt that beats his peace to heaven. So once again, the paradox of peace through war. Notice also that John continues the personification of the land, personification of the, the nation. France will bleed. Philip responds, peace be to England, if that war return from France to England, there to live in peace. England we love, and for that England's sake, with burden of our armor, here we sweat. This toil of ours should be a work of thine, but thou from loving England art so far that thou hast underwrought his lawful king, cut off the sequence of posterity, outfaced infant state, and done a rape upon the maiden virtue of the crown. Philip here frames his presence, his military presence against John's armies as service of England, even though they will be fighting against English soldiers. And instead says that John is the one who is attacking or undermining England by his usurpation of the lawful king's crown, the lawful king's authority. So it raises a question, what does it mean to be loyal to the nation? Is it to be loyal to the leader? Is it to be loyal to the king? And we have the odd paradox of serving England by fighting against its armies in order to put the rightful king, who is not even in England, on the throne. Notice also how Philip characterizes John's usurpation as a form of sexual violence, as a rape. We've seen that before in plays like Titus, Julius Caesar, that association of tyrannical authority with sexualized violence that comes up again and again in Shakespeare. Philip then turns our attention to Arthur himself and to the physical body of Arthur that bears in its form, in its appearance, the signs of its legitimacy. Look here upon thy brother Geoffrey's face. These eyes, these brows, were molded out of his. This little abstract doth contain that large which died in Geoffrey, and the hand of time shall draw this brief into as huge a volume. 
that Geoffrey was thy elder brother born, and this his son. England was Geoffrey's right, and this is Geoffrey's. In the name of God, how comes it then that thou art called a king, when living blood doth in these temples beat, which owe the crown that thou or masterest? So again, Philip here is calling attention to the physical form of Arthur as bearing in its very presence the legitimacy, the lineage, the authority of kingship. And ironically, Philip's argument here recalls John's judgment in the Falconbridge case, his initial judgment from Act 1. The right of the father goes to the eldest son. Philip claims his authority as God's, just as John had claimed to be God's wrathful agent. Here, Philip claims to be taking God's authority to punish the usurper. He says that he takes his authority from that supernal judge that stirs good thoughts in any beast of strong authority to look into the blots and stains of right. That judge hath made me guardian to this boy, under whose warrant I impeach thy wrong, and by whose help I mean to chastise it. John responds, Alack, thou dost usurp authority, to which Philip says, Excuse it is to beat usurping down. So he usurps God's authority to beat down the usurper. This conflict seems to be as much about where authority derives and how we talk about authority as who is the legitimate authority. The conflict between the kings is then displaced by the conflict between the mothers, Eleanor and Constance. Eleanor calls Arthur a bastard, and in doing so impugns Constance's honor, her chastity. This is ironic, again, because in Act 1, bastardy had been, in John's view, no bar to inheritance. But here, by bringing it up, Eleanor is attempting to cast aspersions to undermine Arthur's claim. Constance denies the accusation and says that her son is liker in feature to his father, Geoffrey, than thou and John in manners being as like as rain to water or devil to his dam. So in other words, Geoffrey and Arthur are more alike than even John and Eleanor, and John and Eleanor are as alike as the devil and his dam, the devil and his mother. So with the imp implicit comparison that John and Eleanor are devilish in their behavior, are evil. And this emphasizes Arthur's likeness to his father since Constance is essentially saying John and Eleanor are identical, Arthur and Geoffrey are even more alike than you two, and you two are identical. So this sort of transcendent Arthur is Geoffrey, reborn in a sense. Constance goes on in her denial to say, My boy a bastard, by my soul, I think his father never was so true begot, it cannot be if thou wert his mother. Here Constance denies the accusations against her chastity, and De defends her son's legitimacy, but ironically attacks Eleanor's chastity and in doing so delegitimizes her own husband, Geoffrey, by suggesting that Eleanor was unfaithful and that Geoffrey could have been a bastard. Eleanor immediately picks up on this and says, there's a good mother boy that blots thy father, good mother who says that your father was a bastard. And Constance replies, there's a good granddam boy that would blot thee that would accuse you of bastardy. Family member against family member. And there's almost a sense that there is no way to prove the legitimacy of one without, in some sense, undermining one's legitimacy in another arena. That is, the women here seem to be put in an untenable situation. Family members against family members. Constance has to, in order to, to support her son's legitimacy, she also undermines it at the same time. It's as if the situation itself is so complicated and the way they have to think and talk about these issues is so complicated that they can't help but be put at odds with themselves and be forced into contradictions and contradictory positions. And now the debate between Constance and Eleanor is replaced by the contest between the Duke of Austria, the Archduke of Austria, and the Bastard. We should remember that the Bastard is the Bastard offspring of Richard Lionheart and Austria is the murderer of Richard Lionheart. On stage, Duke of Austria would be wearing a lion skin, the lion skin that he took from Richard when he killed him. The bastard plays on this as he mocks and insults the Archduke. Austria asks, what the devil art thou? And the bastard replies, one that will play the devil, sir, with you. 
and it may catch your hide and you alone. You are the hare of whom the proverb goes, whose valor plucks dead lions by the beard. I'll smoke your skin coat, and I catch you right. Sirrah, look to it. If faith, I will, in faith. In contrast to Arthur, who has allied with Richard's murderer, the bastard here is challenging Austria, challenging his father's murderer, taking on the role as son, and saying he will take back his father's skin and take the skin from Austria, make him his trophy. So after this verbal sparring, John and the King of France turn to their public address to the city of Angiers, each declaring their right to the city. When Hubert addresses them and asks who approaches the city, Philip of France says, "'Tis France for England." So France is there speaking on behalf of England, that is speaking on behalf of Arthur, who they are arguing is the rightful king. So the king is identified with the land itself. John, however, says England for itself, identifying himself again as the king with the land itself. And here, very importantly, pointing out the difference between his claim and Arthur's claim. Arthur's claim is made through surrogates, whereas John makes his claim himself. As I discussed in class, this play questions legitimacy, is, is about legitimacy, the question of legitimacy, and it undermines John's claims by suggesting that he's a usurper. But at the same time, that is held up against the fact that he possesses the throne and that he is uh, apparently a more able king than the young child, Arthur. So legitimacy is one thing, but ability is another. And John possesses the crown. He is the king, whether or not he has the right to the kingship. John frames his address to Angiers as an act of protection. He says that he is there to protect Angiers from the violence that the French army is threatening it with, and he puts it in that, la that bodily language again. Listen to John's words. These flags of France that are advanced here before the eye and prospect of your town have hither marched to your endamagement. The cannons have their bowels full of wrath, and ready mounted are they to spit forth their iron indignation against your walls. All preparation for a bloody siege and merciless proceeding by these French comforts your city's eyes, your winking gates. And but for our approach, these those sleeping stones that as a waste doth girdle you about by the compulsion of their ordnance by this time from their fixed beds of lime had been dishabited and wide havoc made for bloody power to rush upon your peace. So he places it, he, he frames it as a bodily attack that the French are attacking the body of the city of Angiers, so the Angiers is, is itself a body. And so the city here stands, the body of the city, that is, stands in for the body of the citizens, the subjects who will be killed in the battle. It goes on. But on the sight of us, your lawful king, who painfully, with much expedient march, have brought a countercheck before your gates to save unscratched your city's threatened cheeks, Behold, the French amazed vouchsafe, vouchsafe apparel, and now, instead of bullets wrapped in fire to make a shaking fever in your walls, they shoot but calm words folded up in smoke to make a faithless error in your ears. Which trust accordingly, kind citizens, and let us in, your king, whose labored spirits, forewearied in this action of swift speed, craves harborage within your city walls. So whereas the French are there to destroy Angiers, to injure its body, to, in a sense, rape it, John presents himself there as protecting the innocent, fragile, vulnerable body of Angiers. Philip responds, first delineating Arthur's claim, and then responding more specifically to John's accusations. He says to Angiers, be pleased then to pay that duty which you truly owe to him that owns it, owes it, namely this young prince. And then our arms, like to a muzzled bear, save an aspect, hath all offense sealed up. Our cannon's malice vainly shall be spent against the invulnerable clouds of heaven. And with a blessed and unvexed retire, with unhacked swords and helmets all unbruised, we will bear home that lusty blood again, which here we came to spout against your town, and leave your children, wives, and you in peace. But if you fondly pass our proffered offer, tis not the rounder of your old-faced walls can hide you from our messengers of war, though all these English and their discipline were harbored in their rude circumference. 
So France is more threatening in their words to Angiers and makes the threat rather explicit by referencing the children, wives, and you. Who will be the victims of this war? Your children and wives will be the victims if you defy us. If you defy us. When Hubert then responds that they await to see who will prove the king, which one of them will, will prove to be the victor, there is a little debate on what it takes to show, what proves one's kingship, what shows kingship. John says, doth not the crown of England prove the king? Doesn't the office itself, doesn't the fact that I'm wearing the accoutrements of office, that I'm holding the office, doesn't that prove that I am king? And if not that, I bring you witnesses, twice 15,000 hearts of England's breed, to verify our title with their lives. So the, the violence and the might and the blood of his followers argues, he says, presents his right. A battle ensues, and after the battle, again, we have the Herald each of France and the Herald of England claiming authority, claiming victory, rather. The French herald says, you men of Angiers, open wide your gates and let young Arthur, Duke of Britain, in, who by the hand of France this day hath made much work for tears in many an English mother, whose sons lie scattered on the bleeding ground, many a widow's husband groveling lies, coldly embracing the discolored earth. And victory with little loss doth play upon the dancing banners of the French, who are at hand, triumphantly displayed, to enter conquerors and to proclaim Arthur of Britain, England's king and yours. So what are the signs that the French herald relies on? The blood that they've shed, all the dead bodies, and of course their English bodies. So we have the irony of fighting for England by killing the sons of England. And he relies also on the display of the banners. So these are the signs of their victory, the blood, the bodies, the banners. The English Herald has his own version of the victory speech. Rejoice, you men of Angiers, ring your bells. King John, your king and England's, doth approach, commander of this hot, malicious day. Their armors that marched hence so silver bright, hither return all gilt with Frenchmen's blood. There stuck no plume in any English crest that is removed by a staff of France. Our colors do return in those same hands that did display them when we first marched forth. And like a jolly troop of huntsmen, come our lusty English, all with purpled hands, dyed in the dying slaughter of their foes. Open your gates and give the victors way. So they also rely on the signs of blood and bodies and banners that display, that display their victory. But... But, as Hubert says, neither is obviously the victor. Despite these apparent signs of victory, neither can be adju adjudged as the victor. Blood hath bought blood, and blows have answered blows. Strength matched with strength, and power confronted power. Both are alike, and both alike we like. So, these signs that they appeal to, to prove who is greater, who is the victor, who is the rightful king, none of them can be interpreted. None of them actually say what they want them to say. Just as, as I've argued, the meaning of events is constantly up for debate. Does, is something a sign of providence or is it just a random happenstance? What is the path of history? What is the meaning of these historical events? What are the meanings of the signs that we use to display ourselves, our power? Where does that meaning come from? So as I suggested in, in class, this play questions the meaning that we find in events, the meaning that is found in history. Can history be interpreted to have a purpose, a meaning, a pathway? Similarly, the signs of victory and authority are held up and scrutinized and found to be lacking in meaning. The crown does not signify kingship. The blood and the banners and the bodies neither signifies victory. So how do we understand these events? How do we make meaning out of them? How do we make meaning out of history? The bastard, when he makes his appeal to France and England to join forces, he tells them, your royal presence is be ruled by me. So his wit, his intelligence, um, his ability as a soldier for a moment makes him even superior to the nobles. Be friends a while and both conjointly bend your sharpest deeds of malice on this town. 
by east and west let france and england mount their battering cannon charge to the mouths till their soul-fearing clamors have brawled down the flinty ribs of this contemptuous city so again we see here the language of bodily outrage bodily injury and the city personified the political unit personified the bastard says that if they do this then in a moment fortune shall call forth out of one side her happy minion to whom in favor she shall give give the day that is after they have done battle on the city and when they turn to do battle with these, with themselves with each other fortune will determine a, a victor fortune will determine who deserves to win so once more we have fortune rearing her head fortune chance fate destiny the mysterious process by which history unfolds that the mystery the mysterious process by which history unfolds and events occur there's a humorous moment as they plan their attack their joint attack on the city john says that he will shoot from the west austria from the north and france from the south and the bastard wittily replies oh prudent discipline from north to south austria and france shoot in each other's mouths so the allies ironically in joining with their enemy england are facing against each other they're shooting towards the city of angiers but shooting at each other so the allies are shooting at each other uh, unexpectedly so we see yet another disjunction and another unexpected reversal of course before the battle can begin hubert suggests the marriage the alliance between france and england that louis the dauphin should marry blanche john's niece hubert describes this union as a one in which perfection shall meet perfection he says that both the dauphin and Blanche are so perfect, are so complete, that the only thing that's missing is that they are not the other person. She, such as she is in beauty, virtue, birth, is the young dolphin every way complete. If not complete of, say he is not she. And she again wants nothing to name want, if want be not that she is not he. He is the half part of a blessed man left to be finished by such as she and she a fair divided excellence whose fullness of perfection lies in him. So they are both perfect in themselves, yet they require the other for their perfection in a certain sense. So we see here the language, very high, um, elaborate, eloquent language of union, of harmonious union. He goes on. Oh, two such silver currents, when they join, do glorify the banks that bound them in, and two such so shores, to, to two such streams made one, two such controlling bounds shall you be, kings, to these two princes, if you marry them. This union shall do more than battery can to our fast-closed gates, for at this match, with swifter spleen than powder can enforce, the mouth of passage shall we fling wide open and give you entrance." all of this highbrow language of love and romance and perfection and virtue this is very clearly a cynical uh, opportunistic move by hubert and i think the engagement is undercut by the fact that it comes right after the machiavellian union between france and england just for the purposes of destroying angiers we see here just another ad hoc cobbled together union but now placed in much uh, but using the language of marriage being placed uh, up on a pedestal so to speak we had any doubts that this is a political cynical marriage opportunistic marriage there's the discussion of the dowry where john says that he will give france all these various uh territories as part of his dowry to blanche for anjou and fair terrain maine poitiers and all that we upon this side the sea except this city now by us besieged this will be her dowry so he gives land uh, so we see what france gets out of it and at the same time, Louis, for his part expresses his love for blanche but does it in a very narcissistic way in her eye i find a wonder or wondrous miracle the shadow of myself formed in her eye which being but the shadow of your son becomes a son and makes your son a shadow is a pun on s-o-n s-u-n I do protest I never loved myself till now in fixed I beheld myself drawn in the flattering table of her eye. So he sees his image in her eye. 
He imagines that she finds him beautiful, and it is that that he loves. He loves himself as he imagines that she sees him. And the bastard ironically comments on this in an aside. Drawn, hanged, and quartered, he says. Drawn in the flattering table of her, her eye, hanged in the frowning wrinkle of her brow, and quartered in her heart. He doth, espy, he doth espy himself love's traitor. This is pity now, that hanged and drawn and quartered, there should be in such a love so vile a lout as he. So the bastard doesn't seem to take Lewis's words very seriously. For her part, Blanche is accepting of the marriage, but doesn't seem to be too excited. My uncle's will in this respect is mine. If he see aught in you that makes him like, that anything he sees which moves his liking, I can with ease translate it to my will. So she subordinates her will to her uncle's. This is a reversal of the suggestion that um, it is Eleanor's will, the mother's will, that dominates John. Now John dominates his niece's will. And this marriage, this political marriage, is then sealed in a physical gesture, in a physical ritual. Young princes, close your hands, says King Philip, and your lips too, the Duke of Austria, the Archduke of Austria says. So the physical union and the contact between bodies, the bodies of Lewis and Blanche, embodies, represents, stands in for the union between, the new union between the Kingdom of England and the Kingdom of France. In the speech, at the end of the scene, the bastard mocks what he's seen before, finds it mad, unthinkable almost. Mad world, mad kings, mad composition. John, to stop Arthur's title in the whole, hath willingly departed with a part. So the, ir so the irony that John, attempting to maintain all of his crown, all of his kingdom, has to leave part of it, give up part of it, in order to maintain his right. And he mocks France, who also, in service of self-interest, abandons their, their loyalty to Arthur, abandoned their claim, and took an easier way out. Lest we think the bastard is a moralizer, he says, well, the only reason why I'm blaming these people for acting in their self-interest is that I haven't been able to act in my own self-interest. Why rail I on this commodity? But for because he hath not wooed me yet. Not that I have the power to clutch my hand when his fair angels would salute my palm, but for my hand, as unattempted yet, like a poor beggar, raileth on the rich. Well, whilst I am a beggar, I will rail and say there is no sin but to be rich. And being rich, my virtue then shall be to say there is no vice but beggary. Since kings break faith upon commodity, gain be my lord, for I will worship thee. So it's something of a refreshing admission on the bastard's part. Yes, he criticizes the others for their self-interest, but he admits that he's just as self-interested and they are. And that's one of the things that makes his character so fascinating and enjoyable. He's able to see and comment on things that the other characters aren't, but he also has this, again, honesty, earthiness, liveliness. The second scene of Act Two is a much shorter scene, and it serves, I think, as a counterpart to this. In the first scene, we saw, again, these attempts to cobble together different alliances, the rapid reversals, joining together, disjoining, etc. Now we see in the second scene the effects of those betrayals and alliances on Constance. And so what we see in this scene, I think, is how the theme of disjunction that I've been talking about as, as uh, constantly recurring through this play, now that is extended into the individual life, into the individual mind. Constance, upon being told that France has allied with England and essentially abandoned Arthur's claim, is rather distraught. Gone to be married, gone to swear a peace, false blood to false blood joined. Gone to be friends, shall Lewis have Blanche and Blanche those provinces? It is not so, thou hast misspoke, misheard. Be well advised, tell o'er thy tale again. So. She's repeating, she's, she's shocked at these strange alliances that she characterizes as false blood joined to false blood. So there's, she sees in this, so she sees in this union something corrupt, something infected. As her speech goes on, we see that her language itself becomes disordered and filled with contradictions. I, it cannot be, thou dost but say tis so. So it cannot be versus you are saying it so. I trust I may not trust thee, for thy word is but the vain breath of a common man. 
Believe me, I do not believe thee, man. I have a king's oath to the contrary. So she trusts that she may not trust. She tells him to believe that she does not believe him. She contrasts the vain breath of a common man to the oath of a king. And then we see her start to break down even more. Thou shalt be punished for thus frighting me, for I am sick and capable of fears, oppressed with wrongs and therefore full of fears, a widow, husbandless, subject to fears, a woman naturally born to fears. So that repeti repetition of fears four times suggests her obsessiveness, suggests her growing hysteria as she's been abandoned by her former allies. And she... She says, and though thou now confess, thou didst but jest with my vexed spirits, I cannot take a truce, but they will quake and tremble all this day. So even if you told me you were just joking, I'm so upset that I couldn't get myself to calm down. I couldn't make my spirits calm down. I couldn't call a truce with them. So she is at war within herself. So while England and France have united, she has split internally. She has been torn apart and finds herself at war with herself. Constance then asks a series of questions, and here we see her trying to find meaning, trying to interpret these signs. Again, as I've said, this play is an attempt to understand, to try to find meaning in historical events. Here, Constance tries to, tries to find meaning in the gestures of the, mer the messenger. What dost thou mean by shaking of thy head? Why dost thou look so sadly on my son? What means that hand upon that breast of thine? Why holds thine eye that lamentable ream like a proud river peering over his bounds? By these sad, be these sad signs confirmers of thy words? Then speak again, not all thy former tale, but this one word, whether thy tale be true. So this, when he responds that yes, the tale is true, Constance says, Oh, if thou teach me to believe this sorrow, teach thou this sorrow how to make me die. And let belief in life encounter so, as doth the fury of two desperate men, which in the very meeting fall and die. So the image of her at war with her spirits, her vexed spirits, that self-division, she wants to take that even further and die from this. The, the news is so horrible that she can only, if it's true, if she has to believe it, she would rather be dead. Arthur tries to comfort her, saying, I do beseech you, madam, be content. And Constance replies, If thou that bidst me be content wert grim, ugly and slanderous to thy mother's womb, full of unpleasing blots and sightless stains, lame, foolish, crooked, swart, prodigious, patched with foul moles and eye-offending marks, I would not care. I then would be content, for then I should not love thee. No, nor thou become thy great birth, nor deserve a crown. But thou art fair, and at thy birth, dear boy, nature and fortune join to make thee great. Of nature's gifts thou mayest with lilies boast, as and with the half-blown rose. So this might seem cruel at first, she says, if you were ugly, if you were a deformed child, then I would be content. I wouldn't love you, and I wouldn't be so upset about this. But you're beautiful. So I do love you. And that sounds very superficial and shallow and cruel. But, but this isn't about the beauty so much of Arthur, but about what she reads the beauty as meaning, how she interprets the sign of his beauty. He is fair. He has the gifts of nature. He has the blood of Geoffrey and Richard in him. He should be the king to all appearances. That's the form that he bears. He bears the signs of kingship in his body. And his mother says, if you didn't have those signs of kingship, if you were ugly and foul, if you looked evil, if you looked base and deformed, then this wouldn't be so terrible. This wouldn't be so awful. So again, she's trying to find meaning. She's trying to understand the world around her and finding that it does not conform. The signs and the reality do not conform to the understanding that she had. The theme of fortune comes back in her speech. But fortune, oh, she is corrupted, changed, and won from thee. She adulterates hourly with thine uncle John, and with her golden hand hath plucked on France to tread down fair respect of sovereignty, and made his majesty the bawd to theirs. So his fairness is contrasted with the corruption or foulness of fortune. And fortune here is figured as a sexually impure, sexually promiscuous woman. 
So it continues the theme of female unchastity that we've seen raised earlier and the accusations of bastardy and the association of uh, promiscuity, unchastity with usurpation, with political corruption. And by depicting Fortune as a strumpet, as a promiscuous woman, Constance is again attempting to understand what has happened to her, how these events have led to her son losing his claim to the throne. If it was his fate, if it was his fortune, if he was born to be king, then the only way he could lose his, his right, lose his claim, is if Fortune was unfaithful, is if Fortune made him a bastard, is if Fortune cheated on him. So we get, again, this, this attempt to understand events, attempt to understand history, to understand the passage of time, and to make some sort of meaning out of it, to explain why things happen. But as we'll see, events constantly spiral out of control, out of the understanding of the individual watchers. Constance closes this scene out with an act of defiance. She's called to the kings, messengers called her the kings, but she refuses. I will not go with thee. I will instruct my sorrows to be proud, for grief is proud and it make his owner stoop. To me and to the state of my great grief let kings assemble. For my grief so great that no supporter but the huge firm earth can hold it up. Here I and sorrows sit. Here is my throne. Bid kings come bow to it. So she compares her grief to a state, to a nation. She says it is her throne. So she puts her grief against the might of the kings. Her sorrow stands as a challenge to the legitimacy of the king and their political Machiavellian cynical union. So Constance here sets up a symbolic emotional challenge to the legitimacy of the other kings, setting up her emotion versus their law, versus their right, their power. And it is only symbolic, it's not something that has any political efficacy, but I think it stands as a powerful moment nonetheless, a reminder of the real consequences of these machinations and alliances and betrayals and so forth. So to review, we've looked at Act Two and in some way the whole of King John as a play about discontinuity a play about division and the attempt to overcome those divisions through various alliances, through attempts to cobble together different ad hoc collaborations of disparate forces, disparate personalities, disparate ambitions. And the attempt to make something whole, something that has meaning, something that is real, a real nation, a real country. And at the same time, we see the characters struggling to find meaning in the events that they are caught up in and the gestures and the signs around them. Yet all the signs, all the events m tend to escape their apprehension. But as most powerfully dramatized with the character of Constance and her struggle and her sorrow, the, the meaning of these events, the understanding of these events constantly eludes them constantly moves beyond the understanding of any individual. So, so that's the end of our lecture on Act Two of King John. If you have any questions or comments, let me know. Email, comment here, phone, you know how to get in touch. Otherwise, I wish you a good day, a good evening, a good week, a good weekend, and I will see you in the next video. Take care.